You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Saluer la Britannique, Lizzie Degnan, la championne des États-Unis, Megan Guarnier. On va saluer la Hollandaise, Yip Vandenbos, la Canadienne Caroline Canuel, la championne olympique, la championne d'Europe et double lauréate de la Flèche Wallonne. Vos applaudissements pour la Hollandaise, Anna van der Breren. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Orla Shinoui. Hello. And we're in a more exotic setting this month, aren't we, Orla? <laughs> well, I'm not sure exotic is the word I'd use to describe the Well, we're both wearing sunglasses. Media pen. We are in sunglasses and thermals. Uh, it's, it's beautiful sunshine. Mm. Uh, we're in the Ardennes. We're clinging to the side of the Moor de We're about halfway down it at the moment, 500 metres to the summit. Well, not quite halfway, but... Uh, steep old climb, isn't it? We've just seen the women's race get underway and then we've wandered down the hill. Uh, we spoke to a few of the, the riders at the start this morning. We're going to be sort of podcasting as live today as the race unfolds. Um, we're waiting for them to come through here a first time in about 20, 30 minutes or so. Uh, first of two times up the Moor de Huy. There's a, there's a breakaway at the moment. Um, we've got a few interviews for you. We've got a, a, an interview in the final part with a track rider, track sprinter, Victoria Williamson. The uh, Track World Championships have just been held, of course, in Hong Kong. We'll talk a bit about them in the final part. Victoria Williamson wasn't riding. She's on the combat trail, having suffered a horrific injury just over a year ago. So I spoke to her in Manchester recently about um, her year out and how she's battling back. And uh, she had some good news recently, so that's great. And a uh, very gutsy, very gutsy woman and uh, interesting interview. We'll also hear in part two from Pauline ferrand Prevot, the, the French rider who's joined Canyon Shram this year. Uh, former World Road Race champion, a winner here in 2014 at Flesh Wallone. Don't think we've actually mentioned yet that we're at Flesh Wallone. Have <laughs> I we? don't think we have actually. I think we Oops. forgot that that important <laughs> we're at Flesh that, that important detail. <laughs> but we spoke to uh, Pauline from Provo last night, didn't we, Orla, in the Canyon Shram Hotel? Yeah, we did. As you say, f- f- former world champion, actually three-time former world champion. She's had a really tough year actually since the uh, Rio Olympics. She dropped out of the road race and since then really fell out of love with uh, cycling. She said it was her biggest love and it's turned into her biggest nightmare. So she's been really struggling to enjoy the sport again. She's had six months off the bike, coming back to it now. Really interesting to get an insight, I think, into the psyche of someone like that who's had such precocious success. Um, She won those three world titles within a year, had a huge following in France. She had camera crews following her around before the Olympics. So she's one of their golden girls. And then to have that very public disappointment, I think was very hard for her, given that level of success. So yeah, quite, a, I hesitate to say a, a, a darkness to the story, but um, she's certainly been to a dark place. And she says she's on her way back from that. She's been doing really well at mountain biking again and um, coming back to form on the road as well. I'm not quite sure from speaking to her whether she's really found her love of the sport again yet. Yeah, well, she rode well at the weekend in the Amstel Gold Race. Mm. She was eighth there. That's her best performance on the road this year. You know, a lot of pressure on her, a lot of expectations. She's the leader of the Canyon Shram team, which is one of the... The, the bigger, better, and, and you know more uh, well-funded teams in the women's peloton. So a bit of pressure on her. As you say, she's got that profile in France as well. And, uh, you know, she still seems to be sort of caught between the t- her two mm. things of mountain biking and road racing. And, and, you know, speaking to her, it seems that her heart maybe belongs in, in mountain biking. She will go back onto mountain bike after this uh, this spell of racing. Um, but we'll hear from her in part two. She's an interesting uh, athlete and it's an interesting story. At the start this morning, Orla, you and I wandered around the team buses. I had a long old trek out to the <laughs> uh, Team Sunweb bus, which turned up quite late and, and parked what seemed like a long... About 100 metres away, I was a, further than that. It was further than that. Your creaking joint sort of... I was walking for ages. Aching down that road. You um, drew the long straw <laughs> by hanging around the Bulls Dolmans bus, I think. And yep. you spoke to Annemiek van Vluten as well. Yeah, I did. Um, 
uh, Vorica Scott. Um, spoke to her. She was getting her legs massaged this morning. She had that quite remarkable joint third place at Amstel Gold on Sunday. So I asked her about that and asked her about her form as well after the Olympics. So she seems in a fairly good place. I'm happy with how she's doing. Not necessarily going for a conventional win today. She might have to do it from a bit of a breakaway. She says the finish on the Murdoe might be a little bit difficult, but she's my outside bet for today. Well, Anna van der Breggen is the defending champion, the big favourite. She won the Amstel Gold race with a really a really phenomenal performance, strong team performance as well. Um, Annemiek van Vluten has, has been outstanding this year, mm -hmm. one of the real uh, aggressive riders. She's, she's lit up a lot of the races she's ridden, along with Elisa Longo Borghini has been the other informed rider. We talked about her a bit last month. She's missing today, unfortunately. She's unwell. Um, Georgia Bronzini, her uh, Wiggle mm. High Five teammate, is riding, having just arrived back from the World Championships in Hong Kong. Quite surprised to see that she is riding. But as I mentioned, you spoke to a couple of people this morning, um, Annemiek van Vluten and Megan Garnier. I also spoke to uh, Corinne Rivera, who is leading the Women's World Tour. Obviously, she's won two of the events so far, including Tour of Flanders. Um, and uh, not perhaps uh, optimistic, like Annemiek van Vluten of winning on top of the Moor de Huy, but I had a quick chat with her this morning. She'll be wearing the, the leader's jersey again today. Here she is, Corinne Rivera. Corinne, how, how, I mean, how do you reflect on the season so far? You must be absolutely delighted. Yeah, I'm pretty stoked. Yeah, I didn't uh, come into the season expecting this entirely, yeah. but uh, yeah, uh, just learning and maximizing the opportunity. And um, yeah, it's been... Uh, amazing to have the support and the opportunity to race here in Europe uh, well supported especially as a North American uh, but uh, everything's paying off all the hard work uh, the team chemistry and everything so it, it just shows in uh, the way we ride and our, our results. How did you feel on, on Sunday wearing the, the World Tour Leaders jersey I mean they often say the yellow jersey gives you gives you wings did, you seem to be digging very deep as well and you must have been, been proud of your performance but how did it feel to wear that? Yeah, it's pretty special and, uh, you know, trying to represent the team and uh, the jersey as best as I can. And, uh, yeah, I'm just not giving up. So I think that's that's part of the name of the game here and uh, just doing the best that I can with the girls. What about today? How do you, you look on uh, today's race? Um, one that might not suit you quite so well, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's quite a specialized race, um, you know, when it finishes on the top of a hill. Um, I think there's not a ton you can do tactically. Just kind of it is what it is kind of race but yeah we'll, we'll do the best that we can um considering everything and yeah give it everything we can to, uh to get a good result today and what are, are you missing liege bastion liege is that is that right yeah that's correct yeah w would, that, would that change if you were still in the leader's jersey after today or is that is that decided oh uh, no that's been decided uh f from early on in the season that i would uh take a little bit of a break that weekend so um, yeah, just sticking to the plan. Uh, there's a you know long term, long term idea behind it. So just uh, yeah, going with the flow, going with the plan, and um, yeah, it's still a long season. So. so what's the plan after after Sunday? What when will we see, will we see you racing again? Uh, I do Yorkshire, and then I head home uh, the next day, and uh, then get ready for tour California. Great. Well, good luck today. Thank Thanks you. very much. Yeah. So that was Corn Rivera, 24 year old Californian, uh, who's having a, a great a great season with Team Sunweb, her first year with that team. We're just watching a, a dragon <laughs> in a BMC crocodile, top. Richard, <laughs> that, that is very definitely Sorry. a crocodile. I don't know why I said dragon. <laughs> it's definitely a crocodile. <laughs> it's green, it's got two big jaws. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely a crocodile. Yeah, a crocodile. Um, in sorry a BMC that. jersey, maybe that threw you. Why did I say dragon? I, <laughs> I had no know. idea. Anyway, uh, Australian flag. We're giving it, a, it's, I'm giving it wave, a wave. He's, he's waving, waving back. How do you know it's a he? Could be a she. Could be a she. Um, anyway, uh, uh, we heard from Con Rivera there. You spoke uh, to, well, we'd we'll like to introduce who you uh, who you spoke to this morning. Yeah, so we spoke to... Hopefully you um, do a better job of remembering that than, <laughs> than, than the hill that we're standing on. <laughs> I saw you searching your brain for the name of it earlier. <laughs> It's been a long day already, um, and I am a little bit excited to be at the race, I have to admit. But I spoke to Annemiek van Vleuten, as we said, and also Megan Garnier, the um, World Tour, inaugural World Tour winner from last year. Hasn't had the best of season so far. She crashed back in February, uh, quite a nasty crash, and she's been coming back from that. So I was asking her about her form at this stage of the season. So Annemiek van Vleuten and Megan Garnier. So uh, how are you feeling then ahead of today? Yeah, excited. I always like love this race. It's not the race that suits me the best because the uphill finish. But um, yeah, it's lovely to race here. Uh, epic and uh, 
it's an old race, so yeah, it's one of the classics I'm excited for. And how are you finding your form then? A great uh, showing at Amstel Gold. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, maybe not in my Rio top, top, top shape. So uh, I think I can st- build up still a bit later in, the, later in the season. And that's actually also the plan. Um, so yeah, here waiting for the Mura of who here will be not how for me how to win this race. So I will have a different tactic. And uh, do you mind me asking a little bit about Amstel Gold as well and a brilliant race. Um, great to see it back in the women's calendar. Um, happy with your podium? Yeah, super happy because I think that was the, the best I could do that day because there were some, some girls who were be- better than me on the cow. We had uh, troubles and come back and yeah, it was yeah, I was super happy, especially after I made a mistake in the sprint. I was confused with the old finish line, so I did go. I saw some white on the finish line, and then I go sit on my saddle. I thought I was there, and then I sprinted again. So it was a big, mis- big mistake for me, and I was so, so disappointed when I thought like, ah, shit, they out sprinted me for the third place. So uh, I was even more happy that uh, in the end I was the, the shared third place. Yeah, because you'd sprinted for the line that wasn't the finish line. When did you realise what went through your head when you did realise that it wasn't the actual race finish line? Ah, it was not so much my time to think and realise it. It's just like, when, oh shit, it's not the finish line and start to sprint again. And then felt Kasia and Iwidoma coming up on the right. So yeah, big mistake. But after the finish, I was super disappointed and super mad about myself. And then on reflection, maybe quite happy that you managed to keep the podium all the same. Yeah, super happy. That's my first World Tour podium this year, so it's always nice to be on the podium. And what's it like to have a full Arden week for the women here? Crazy. Like, I love it. Like, and also, I think the, what they did in Amsterdam Gold Race with Let Us Start Together with the guys, like 10 minutes behind after them, that was a super good um, move. And also that we finished a bit more early, so we have the TV coverage sort of the last 45k. And then... Then it's on to the men. So I think this this kind of setup is really good for women's cycling. Uh, so Megan Sinan, just about to close, getting ready for the race ahead. How do you feel? Yeah, uh, it's uh, one of the special days today. So we have a strong team and I'm excited. How's your form been? How are you feeling at the moment? Yeah, I'm still coming around from my crash in Hogland and it's been a slow recovery and a little bit frustrating on my end, but um, I'm glad to be back with the team. How difficult is that to have that crash so early in the season as well? You mentioned frustration. I mean, that must be almost as hard as a physical recovery, I guess. Oh, yeah, for sure it's a physical recovery. And then uh, trying to get my fitness back and uh, being back here with the team has been super helpful. Uh, Yeah. And the the, the mood good in the team then? Oh, of course. I think, yeah, you can see we're always smiling and having fun. So that's really important. The cycling podcast Femina is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. Fueled by science. Laura, we're on a cracking spot here, on a grassy knoll overlooking the the climb, and we just saw the riders go through in the first time up the Mur de Hui. Uh, first of two climbs, just 29 kilometres to go in the race now. Ashley Moolman, who was on the on the ground earlier, she crashed, um, somehow managed to get from being on the ground to being off the front on her own. Not yeah. sure how she did that. It sounds like it was quite a big crash, actually. Four riders taken to hospital. Most of the peloton got managed to get straight back up, but Ashley Moolman Passio wasn't one of them. She was checking out her bike, um, a bit slow to get back on, and now... Um, not only managed to bridge the gap to the breakaway, but out front on her own. Um, the rest of the peloton, they were right on her, on her back wheel. Big bunch just yeah. behind her. Um, she's my tip, of course. When we discussed this morning, who might win? She was my tip. You well, will this recall. is this is what I was thinking. Your curses must have floated on the crisp Belgian breeze back to Ashley. She realised that you weren't happy that uh, she was your tip and she was on the ground. So what she got? That was for me. That was Cheers, for you. Ashley. Um, <laughs> no, that was. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's such a great uh, sort of amphitheatre, isn't it, almost here? We're, as I say, we're on this grassy knoll overlooking the climb on, on one of the bends just at 500, 450 metres to go. Decent crowds starting to build. Most people are down at the bottom in, in one of the big tents where they're serving food and so on or up at the top, but we came to the middle. 
And a really good crowd here, actually. We're at one of the steepest corners um, of the Murdui. And the, the fans have been here at least for the last hour anyway, not able to watch any of their race, so there's no screen for them to watch it, um, and just here waiting for the riders to go past. So it's a brilliant atmosphere, actually. It's really enjoyable. Which is disappointing that we can't see the race at the moment on the screen. Um, who did you spot? I, I, I did spot... Uh, I did spot Pauline Ferrand Prevost moving up uh, the outside of the bunch, quite near the front. Who else did you see there? Spotted uh, Lizzie Diagnan looking very strong, actually, at the front of the bunch. Um, seemed to be coming up to the front, actually, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure if she was or not. But out of the saddle, uh, looking very strong and very focused. Um, you never know with Lizzie, actually, on a day like today, if she can uh, put the pressure on and have the team around her. Obviously, you've got to be looking at Anna van der Breggen, but uh, Lizzie would be a nice little outside shout as well, wouldn't Anna she? Anna van der Breggen always throws me that jersey that she's wearing, a European champion mm -hmm. jersey. It's a, not one that we're used to seeing at all. Riders and cars still coming through here. I should say, uh, at this stage, thank you very much to our sponsor, Science of Sport, uh, who, along with Rafa, sponsor the cycling podcast Femina. You can get 20% off all your Science of Sport products at scienceofsport.com uh, if you enter the code C pod 20 that's a new code C pod 20 you will get 20% off which is wonderful um, I mentioned earlier Orla that we spoke to Pauline Ferrand Prevost last night on the comeback trail and um, let's hear from her now uh, this was in, in the Canyon Shram Hotel uh, in the remote forest of the Ardennes it was very nice you did, a, you, you did a bit of yoga I did I had a swim two, le two lengths I Richard. did two lengths <laughs> It was, a not very, it. it was a very long pool. <laughs> it was a very long pool. No, uh, <laughs> swimming. That's not even swimming, is it? That like, that's like with with the, the length of you. That's a that's a barely a stroke to yeah, do. Yeah, I length. didn't really have to even do a stroke. <laughs> just you just I lay down in the, in the water and altered direction. <laughs> I maneuvered myself around <laughs> like a tanker. Anyway. Pauline Ferrand Prevost, we did speak to her <laughs> later on, just before we had dinner. Here she is, Pauline Ferrand Prevost. Yeah, I'm quite happy with my performance in uh, Amstel. I can see it's going better and better uh, every weekend, so I'm quite happy with my shape now. For tomorrow, I think uh, it can be good, but it will be hard to win, so... Yeah, you have to be smart, and uh, I have also my teammates that can protect me, and uh, yeah, we will see for tomorrow. But I feel uh, I feel good, and uh, yeah, first you have to ride with pleasure, and uh, now I find back the pleasure, so everything is right. After the Olympic Games, it was a hard time for me, and yeah, I didn't want to go on the bike anymore because. Yeah, for me it was like a, yeah, a nightmare and yeah, I didn't want to ride. So after two months uh, of the bike, I decided to, to start training again and uh, to try to have a pleasure uh, on, the, uh, on the bike. And finally, yeah, also because of the team, uh, now it's come back and I'm really happy and really motivated to, to train and to race also. So, yeah, I didn't expect that, but yeah, now I can say that I'm happy and yeah, for me it's the biggest victory already. I think now that uh, everything that happened, it's not only bad, because yeah, when you lose, you also learn, so I think I learned a lot. But yeah, you know, I won like three world titles in one year, in one year so for me it was like uh, I was dreaming. And when it's finished, you say, oh, yeah, maybe <laughs> now it's hard and uh, cycling is very hard. And yeah, also because uh, I think I had too much Olympic in my head and for four years I was only thinking about this. And when, when it's finished and you know that you, you can't win, you have to wait another four years, it's really hard mentally. So I was not motivated, but yeah, finally now I have new goals and yeah, the biggest one was to, to come back and to take pleasure and now I say that yeah, maybe I will find uh, my best level again, so for me it's a good motivation. I will do a tour of California and after I will go back on MTB 
Yeah, for me, it's really my motivation, and I could not go go only on the road because I really miss MTB, and yeah, for me, I really need to to change bike, and for my head, especially this year, yeah, I really need to to switch. So I will do MTB again, and uh, yeah, we will see. Before it was uh, only about uh, Gianni Longo, and since I win, uh, I won the world championship on the road. Yeah, it's now they switch, and it's more me. But yeah, it was also a big pressure before the Olympics because yeah, everybody said yeah she will, she will win uh, gold, and she has to win gold, and so for me, it, yeah, it was a pressure. And after the Olympics, of course, the uh, people uh, was really disappointed, and yeah. For me, yeah, it's uh, it was hard to hear uh, things like this, but now, yeah, it's more like uh, I don't care and I I do my own job and yeah, I do what I like the most, cycling. So yeah, I think I have still a French public, but maybe less after the Olympics. You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa for sponsoring the cycling podcast Femina. Very grateful to them for their uh, continued support. Later this week, doing an event at the Rafa Clubhouse Cafe in Manchester with Hannah Barnes, or as she was introduced today, Anna Barnes. <laughs> Anna Barnes. Anna Barnes. It was very cool. Uh, I, I think she enjoyed that. I might, might introduce her like that on Thursday. <laughs> um, but the, the race has just been done and won. Uh, Orla, we're standing just beyond the finishing line. The men's race is on now. And uh, it was won for the third year in a row by Anna van der Breggen. Uh, obviously, her second World Tour win in a row as well. And her the second 1-2 for her team, Bulls Dolmens, with Lizzie, Lizzie Dagnan finishing second once again. Very dominant performance by, the, by those two. Um, you spoke to Lizzie Dagnan. That interview featured in our regular podcast last week. But the bridesmaid again. She seemed very happy at the finish once again for her teammate. But was maybe slightly annoyed or or not? No, no, not that I picked up on anyway. And I don't not think annoyed, but just thinking I'll, I'll get you know it's got to be my chance at some point maybe she is thinking that but that certainly wasn't the feeling today she was delighted with that one too she said it went exactly according to plan um it wasn't necessarily the plan that it would be anna number one and lizzie number two i think she, i think they both would have been just as happy the other way around but lizzie i think is is happy as maybe as much as relieved that she's showing that she's up there again that's her third podium this season which is incredibly good for someone who has um, suffered an awful lot off the bike. She's been um, ill. She's had an awful lot going on since Rio last year. So to show that she can build on that and come back and still be up there um, at the very top and you know, beaten only by her teammate, the other way of looking at that is that she's assisted her teammate to the win and she's also gotten second. She's delighted. And she's spoken as well about... Um, how they felt a bit of pressure um, with what they would see now as premature writing off of Bowles Dolmans as a dominant force. And, you know, she was listening to the podcast <laughs> last month. I was going to say, because I'm guilty of that myself. And, and that's partly because you preempt it, because you think, well, it's going to happen at some stage. They can't stay on top um, for a second season in a row, but of course they can. And they have been hit by illness throughout the team, uh, a bit of misfortune as well. And I mean, I spoke to um, Danny Stam and asked him whether, um, even without that illness, whether they would have been planning to peak for this week, and yet he said that they would have done. So, th- I mean, these are their home races. You can see the orange of uh, balls everywhere. This is a home race for them, so incredibly important from a sponsor point of view to be able to win. So they've come good at exactly the right time, and I think uh, Lizzie Dagnan is just happy to be where she wants to be, that she's getting her form back again, mentally, physically, and, um, you know, she'll be building towards the British race be building towards the worlds and um yeah she's a happy woman today and anna, anna van der bregen we'll hear from her in a moment or two but what a record she's got now you know winning this race three years in a row uh, she won the amstel gold race at the weekend there she's the olympic champion she's the european champion it's a hell of a, a palmaris she's got um 
you mentioned you spoke to Danny Stam, who manages that team. Shall we hear from him and then from Anna van der Breggen? Well, why not? Let's do it. So you must be feeling pretty happy with today's result. Yeah, yeah. The last uh, two races is extremely good, and it uh, is both in the town of the sponsor. So yeah, we are really happy with uh, with these results. How did today pan out in relation to the plan at the start of the day? Well, exact how we planned. <laughs> Uh, we, we wanted to have a small group uh, to the final of the Muir and we expected that we were with three and yeah, that, that was actually how it ended up and from that part we play cat and mouse and yeah, Anna went away and she went with alone. A lot of questions have been asked of the team at the start of the season. There have been illnesses, have been uh, bad luck, certainly compared to the dominance of last season. This must be a nice way to say, yeah, we're still up there. Yeah, but to be honest, I never doubt on that part. I mean, I have a lot of trust in the girls. And, yeah, I said just keep the confidence and keep doing what we have to do. And, okay, we have a lot of illness, but I'm no, I'm, I'm sure that the girls have the ability to, to win races like this. And if we keep patient and don't stress too much and keep by the plan how we want to do the season, well, then we are pretty good now. So what about Anna and Lizzie individually? What are their plans from here? What are your ambitions for them from here in the next couple of races? Well, I think it's, it should be good that they understand each other pretty well. And, well, till that shape is there from them, we have to communicate how we work things out. And, yeah, I mean, it's on the end, it's the call of the, to the, let the team win. And I think they take a break after Yorkshire and then they build up again for uh, for Jira. From the outside, you've got a team of such stars, such talent and such potential that you would imagine that it would be difficult to keep all of that in harmony and to create a good team atmosphere, yet you seem to have done that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's working pretty well, but uh, yeah, f- to be honest, for me, it's not that difficult. I mean, it are one-by-one great uh, girls and... Uh, Actually, we only select girls in the team what fit in the squad. And if they don't fit in the squad, I, we don't think about it to to select them. And sometimes you have a mistake in it, but yeah, not, not so much. And I think we have a great uh, group together and they respect each other and everything. So it's really good. And congratulations. You Thank must you. be absolutely delighted after that. How do you feel? Uh, yeah, I'm really happy, of course. Uh, it's great to win for the team and also uh, how we did the race. I think, uh, yeah, it went like we planned. So that's the best to win races like you planned. You come in as the out and out favourite. Did that put any extra pressure on you or is it all external noise? Well, not really. Um, it's sometimes it's difficult that, that they know which wheel to follow. But in races like this, you know, a climb is a climb. You need to go fast. And if you go fast enough, then they cannot follow. So, yeah, for us it worked out today at the, at the climb before the Muir. And we, we got with three on front. And um, one of them, luckily, was my teammate, Lizzie Degnan. So that was a perfect situation for us. And it could have been Lizzie uh, just the same like it was for me now. And um, so, yeah, big compliments for my team. And I, uh, I'm really happy with them. Fairly relentless attacks on the road today and stayed together pretty much until the end. Was that your plan for it to come together towards the end of the, the, the final climbs and then make your attack? Yeah, that was the plan and it's difficult in a circuit like this to to do something more. Of course, it can be a group in front, but we tried to split it a bit with the crosswinds uh, around K60 and, and that worked, but it was not long enough to split it totally. So then... Yeah, I think you have to wait for the climbs at the end because in this race, the the last climbs are the hardest. So, um, yeah, it's it's a bit maybe waiting the whole day for for a, the war at the end, but it worked out now for three years, so I think that's the best tactic. <laughs> and I presume you're going to be a little bit biased here, but how has it been for you having a full, so far anyway, a full women's Arden week? <laughs> I think that's an easy question for me because I want to now. Um, yeah, for, for us this week until now is perfect. And finally, uh, hopefully we can finish it off uh, on Sunday. So two out of three, um, how confident are you heading into Sunday? 
Well, I think uh, as a team we are uh, looking forward also that last race because it's new for us, so new experience. It's good for the peloton and um, for me personally, I'm, I'm also looking forward. But if it's going to be me or my teammate, I don't really mind. Yeah, maybe it's better now that it's a teammate from me, so we will try to do that. Congratulations, Anna. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Orla, well, I believe there's a boys' race on as well today. Apparently so. So we better get a move on here. But um, uh, we also, I also spoke at the finish <laughs> to uh, members of the Drops team, a team that we follow closely, of course. Uh, Bob Varney is the man in charge. Also with Anna Christian, who rode well, and Abby Van Twisk. So here they are. We'll hear first from Anna Christian, then from Bob Varney, and then from Abby Van Twisk. The first lap, it was like, okay. It was few crosswind sections I got caught out once badly there and then when it hit the mirror that's when it did kick off and we kind of came over the top of here I must have been about 15th wheel maybe and there was about 20 or 20 of us and then about another group came across and it must have been about 25 of us and the next minute all just group back together again and then it did split a few times up the next climbs and then I just got really caught out on one of the climbs which was a bit frustrated with really so you felt you had the the ability to be there. It was yeah. what 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 went wrong at that moment? Just in the wrong position, or yeah, we kind of hit one of the longer climbs, and then it was splitting, and I was sat in a stupid position, and then yeah, and then the group of like however many twenty of them went, and then obviously sat in our group, and it was just such a lull, and I was like oh god, and then came up the mirror last time and felt all right, so <laughs> a bit <Wow>. annoying. <laughs> you know, on a climb like this and on a course like this, you really have the opportunity to test yourself, don't you, against the very best in the world and it's such a tough climb there's no no hiding place there how did you feel you compared yeah the second time definitely felt longer than the first time up it but you see like 250 to go and you think oh it's not that far but it is, it is far <laughs> when you carry on over the top but yeah it was cool to be racing up there the crowds up there were amazing it was so good but um yeah weird smell of sausages as well but not the nicest <laughs> yeah Bob be happy yeah, I think I am. Yeah, it's, these girls are riding with the best bike riders in the world. We listened to it on the race radio in the car, and obviously we were delighted when Anna was mentioned by the race commentator. He then said that she was distanced from the very front of the group, and we were a little disappointed. But the second rider after that he mentioned that was dropped was uh, Megan Garnier. So, you know, that kind of, within like 30 seconds on the radio, that, that captured everything that she'd done you know she's up there with the best girls in the world and uh, and they're getting better they're growing as a team and individually and yeah we've almost got a bit blase about it but we must have had two or three in the top 50 today i would have thought you know it's yeah and you can see with every race little signs of improvement and growing confidence can you yeah i can from all of them yeah i think we use the new normal you know the new normal, the Cipollini bus. We haven't got the Passat, we've upgraded to a Skoda, but we've got a tent this year. So, you know. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Abby, how are you? Abby's been on the podcast as well. Yeah, yeah. Abby's yeah. a friend of the podcast. Abby, we saw your face when you saw the, the profile. Yeah. You put a picture on Instagram. Uh, Orla showed it to me. How did it go today? It was savage. That's it. <laughs> um, yeah. It was kind of controlled until you hit the mur for the first time on the small lap and then it just went off and um just split to pieces really and then yeah but it was it's a good race what, what do you learn from a race like this i mean you're obviously racing against the best but on a on a course like this the the battle for position you know on the approach to the climbs i mean the least of it can be the, the climb itself. It's the it's a fight to be in the right position going into the climb. What what do you take away from a, a race like this? Yeah, you can learn so much from, like, if you get near the front at the beginning of the climb, um, it just helps you so much because if your legs can't, like, if you can't go with the front, you've got slippage room. And with the younger riders like us, like, when we get the strength, hopefully we'll be able to stay up there more. But it's yeah, so much to do with positioning and everything like that, moving up in the wind, following the right wheels and stuff like that. What's next? Um, Luxembourg, Tour of Luxembourg on the 27th. Well, Orla, I mentioned a few times my tip of the day was Ashley Moulman Passio. We saw her off the front, first time at the Moor de Huy. She was sixth at the line and I caught up with her at the finish. Tell us what happened on, on the first time. You were involved in the crash, I think, is that right? 
yeah um stupid crash you know the normal traffic um furniture in the road and someone came to a full stop in front of me and i had nowhere to go so i crashed uh, it wasn't a hard crash it was just frustrating um, because my car was up the road to be with um ali who was in the breakaway so i had to sort myself out which took longer than it should have um and it was at the worst possible moment because it was just before we turned into crosswinds and then the climbing for the final started so i had to work really hard um, <clears throat> to get back and um, then on the um, steep climb before we entered the final circuit the first time up the mere you know i i wanted to put an attack there and see what happened and no one came with me <clears throat> i felt really strong um, but then i suppose I, I spent too much you know i had just done a big effort to come back from the crash and attacked there crossed to ali in the front came up the mere um, in the front of the race and yeah, I think that all added up on the last climb um, up the Shiraf before the final meet. I just didn't have that extra push to be with the front three. Um, but my teammate Marie also did an incredible job. I think as a team, we raced very aggressively and we showed that, um, you know, we, we're a young team and we're challenging um, to just keep it in improving and challenging the other bigger teams and yeah i'm proud of the effort today we, i mean we heard you were on on the ground and the next thing we saw you off the front on the moor as you said was it one of those situations where sometimes the adrenaline is, is pumping harder after a crash and perhaps perhaps you got maybe carried away a little bit once you got back to the group Ah, uh, yeah perhaps that is what happened as you say you know the adrenaline is pumping and just come from behind and you know instinct was to go um, but yeah for sure it cost me in in the final I mean, is this the, you're, you're a great climber, obviously. Is this a race that you pinpoint every year as one that you you know you you perhaps could could add to your Palmares yeah. at some point? Yeah, always finishing. You know, I finished third in 2013. I finished fifth. I finished fourth. I finished sixth today. I just wish I could win. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to keep trying. It is, is, is timing so you know the really important factor in, in winning this race. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the final time up the meter is just insanely hard and uh, you need every ounce of energy. And yeah, anything wasted along the route is going to cost you up the final climb. So yeah, every year I try again. So that was Flesh Wallone. He had a nice time at Flesh Wallone, Orla. It's been lovely, actually. We've been lucky with the weather. I like a bit of live race action, you know me. Music's going, the smell of hot dogs in the air. I'm in my <laughs> element. Well, <laughs> let's um, let's move indoors uh, briefly in this final part, um, at least in our imaginations, <laughs> because the World Track Championships just finished in Hong Kong, um, and uh, from the women's point of view, some outstanding performances. I thought I would mention. We're going to hear from Vicky Williamson, who wasn't riding but hopes to be back at the Worlds next year. Um, standout performances, though. Uh, Katie Archibald in the Omnium, outstanding, especially in the points race at the end there. Um, r incredible race. Thought she'd thought she'd blown it at one point. Seemed to really she went out went out like a rocket, then died a bit, and then came back. It was it was a thrilling race. Eleanor Barker as well, who got two silvers and a, eventually a gold medal in the points race. Another thrilling points race that one. Yeah, and brilliant for Eleanor Barker to get her first individual world gold. She uh, posted a picture afterwards saying, no longer the eternal bridesmaid. Um, so she's chuffed with that. And a brilliant display from her to win that gold as well. It took a lot of, well, d uh, discipline, really, to stay calm in that race. She expected to be a marked woman and ended up not being so much. She got a fairly early lap with uh, Sarah Hammer. And then I think she expected to be able to just keep riding and winning the, winning the sprints, which she was doing, but then Hammer got another lap. So within 10 laps, Eleanor Barker knew that she had to get a lap and win the final sprint. That takes a lot of sang-froid, as was the a, French would yeah, say. Yeah, I mean, Sarah Hammer is so strong. Not, exactly. not, a, not a sprinter, but she was such a threat. And, and, and Barker, you know, it's, it's always in the point where it's so tactical and, and timing is everything. Um, and, you know, there's a little bit of luck comes into it as well, I think. Yeah, but, but I think an awful lot of um, just focus as well. Because if you think, if you've ever been in a velodrome or watched 
um, when a points race really heats up towards the end and and you know that it all hinges on someone getting a lap and winning a sprint the atmosphere into that velodrome is phenomenal and I'm always in awe of how the riders they must absorb some of that they must be aware of some of that and to be able to keep your mind keep focused I mean that's what they do obviously they are professionals but to be able to do that against the likes of someone like Sarah Hammer who is so strong and so experienced was a wonderful way to win her first individual at gold I think so well done Eleanor a few more performances worth mentioning. Chloe Dygart, 20-year-old American, uh, who won the individual pursuit and uh, the team pursuit with the American team. They won team pursuit at the Worlds last year as well, of course, and then won a silver medal at the, uh, the, the Rio Olympics. A lot of changes in that American team. Andy Sparks, Sarah Hammer's husband, has actually left his position um, amid bullying allegations. He's been on the podcast before. I want to catch up with him on that. He was in Hong Kong because he still coaches Chloe Dygart. So... Um, that's been an unfortunate turn of events, but they, they obviously um, still riding very well and, and won the Team Pursuit gold medal again. Women's Madison, first Women's Madison mm. in the World Championship, won by Jolene Dürr and Lottie Kopecky, uh, the Belgian riders, uh, very experienced riders, uh, and won it in pretty dominant fashion. Um, but I mentioned that we're going to hear from Vicky Williamson, who has been on this uh, terrible journey, but I found her a very, very positive, upbeat character, very... Um, very optimistic uh, that she's going to be able to return and, and get back to the level she was at or perhaps even higher. I think watching the Rio Olympics, watching her old friend Becky James, um, who's been through her similar uh, sort of setbacks and, and come back and, and won a medal in Rio, it's given her great encouragement. So here she is, Vicky Williamson. Vicky, we're, we're, we're in the National Cycling Centre. It's, it's over a year now since your, your crash. And to take you back to that and people will remember seeing the, the pictures it was you don't remember much about the incident itself do you uh, no I don't um, I'm lucky actually in a way that I didn't remember anything I just remember holding on to the fence before I was about to go up and and that's it really in and out of consciousness as I was being wheeled into hospital and uh, Ellie Richardson uh, a rider who was guesting for GB um, was with me and at this point I think I was so high on all the painkillers I just was trying to tell her to take a picture of me but I think I was uh, unaware of the state of which my body was in at this point so and, and she was aware and others obviously had seen so were you did you become aware of of their shock um not really like I said I spent half the time sort of out unconscious really so I was sort of unaware and I think to begin with the diagnosis was that I'd sort of cracked a few ribs and you know, it wasn't very serious, so I think she was relaying it back to the coaches and my fiancé in the UK, and it's sort of the first call started off as, you know, she's had a crash, she's OK, she's broken her ribs, and then Ollie, my fiancé, was sort of like, oh, that's, you know, it's not great, but, you know, at least she's OK. And then sort of the next call came, and it was, OK, I think she's, you know, broken her back. And then it's sort of like when the full diagnosis came out, it was like they were all sort of on a, the first plane out there, really, so... Can you tell us, uh, you know, once uh, in the final analysis, what the full extent of your injuries was? Yep, so I um, broke my neck, back and pelvis and also dislocated the pelvis as well. I also had a large flank wound on my right-hand side, which we think was split open when I hit into the fence. And then as I slid onto the track, it was sort of like a motorbike crash and my back just tore open. Sorry for the gore detail here. <laughs> Uh, so the first, yeah, the operation sort of involved pins into the bottom of my lumbar spine, a large pin into my pelvis, and then obviously the the stitching up of of the flank wound, and I also lost sort of all my oblique muscle, as you can imagine, it was sort of exposed to the elements and actually and died off as I did lose two thirds of blood. So that was another another um, risk, but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't great. <laughs> And yeah, it could have been it could have been worse, um, you know, in, in terms of you know future movement and so on. Oh, definitely. Like, although you know, everyone says, "Oh, you're so unlucky to have had a crash that bad." I mean, I've not really heard of many track cycling crashes that have been as severe as that. But I don't really see it as that. I just see it as that I'm so lucky to have not come out sort of in a wheelchair or any permanent, you know, damage. Hopefully now everything can start to repair I mean my my left um l5s1 nerve root is still damaged down my left leg but I mean in the year that I've sort of had to recover my, from my knee down to my ankle I can actually feel the sensation back so it's only my foot 
to go. So that's promising that that nerve has actually repaired. But um, yeah, I'm just lucky, really, really lucky. Well, you say you say you're lucky, and uh, you know it's a long time now since the the crash. But was that your mindset throughout? Were you? You must have had a period of feeling feeling quite sorry for yourself as well. Um, mm, I, I tried really hard not to. I mean, I had um, quite a few people in to see me. It was like I was fully booked, really. Everyone was sort of saying, you know, when can I come and see you? And I said, oh, I've got so-and-so on Tuesday, so-and-so on Wednesday. You know, it's going to have to be Friday. And so in that sense, I think that's why I sort of managed to stop myself from going into a an absolute hole, really, and, and just digging myself deeper and deeper and just losing my mind. But, yeah, like I said, I'm lucky that I was in a side ward, so I constantly had someone with me or someone visiting in that sense. So I managed to stay positive if I would have stayed out in Holland maybe for the four or five weeks and ended up on my own I think I really would have struggled then but support is is a massive help and I think obviously being an athlete although it's what got me in the hospital in the first place that's the mindset that I've attacked the injury with just to keep going and always looking forward and little little gains and you know minor things that you might not see as as a big thing sort of sitting upright and things like that for me were massive targets and because I always had a target I never let myself get sort of too upset really but yeah there were times when it was when it was you know not great when you're sort of laying on a bed and you can't move and you're trying to sleep with a neck brace on it's not not fun but um yeah, I'm here to tell the story. So. Well, the, the neck brace was a, a choice, wasn't it? I mean, you, did you not have a, the option of the neck brace or a, an operation that might not have guaranteed full movement of the neck? It seems that decisions you were making that it was very, it was in your thoughts very early on that you wanted to, you know, that you were thinking of coming back and racing again. Yeah, definitely. The um, yeah, the deal with the neck brace was basically he could pin it sort of as he'd pinned everything else, but. Um, the surgeon, Mr. Science, sort of did an impression of basically how my neck movement would be, and he said, "You know, all the physio in the world won't move this because there will be physically two two pins in there." And as soon as he stood there and moved his neck, what seemed to me like two degrees, I was like, "No, not not even a choice. Like, there would be no way that you could ride have having that little movement." and like I said, it was another operation, really, although it meant that I wouldn't have had to have the collar. The movement was more important to me, so I battled through with that collar for four months, and then I think I needed to torch it by the end. I'd absolutely had enough, but um, fair play to anyone or anyone that has worn them or has got to wear them. Like I do feel your pain, and they are, I can confirm, as uncomfortable as they look. <laughs> But that was a sacrifice, I, I suppose, a short term, although it must have felt long term at the time, sacrifice you were prepared to make again because your long term goal seems to have been always to, to come back. I mean, have there been moments where you've wondered whether you really wanted to come back, given that it was, you know, racing that, that put you in this in, in hospital in the first place? Um, no, definitely not. I've always had the um, the mindset of getting back. It's just a case of when, really, obviously, I've sort of learnt to appreciate now that I do need time and that rushing things is not the answer. If I wanted to do an exercise that I wasn't ready for just for the sake of a, a one-week gain, that it could end up putting me back three weeks. So I'm just trying to be patient, or, well, I have learnt to be patient now before um, anyone who knew me before um, the accident would know that I was quite impatient and sort of wanted results then and there sort of I'd try something new in the gym wouldn't be good at it wouldn't be seeing the power on the track and then would you know go to the coaches and say I want results now why am I not seeing the power and they'd say just trust in it you know believe and in a few months you'll see the power and they were always right but I just always wanted to see results then and there but now I think I'll come back a better athlete because I've got that patience I've got more drive than ever, not that I wasn't before, but obviously now I've really got the passion and stuff to get back because I feel like there's, there's something that I still could achieve. What what was it like watching Rio? I mean, did, did you watch it? I know that that was the main target for you. It must have been difficult. Did you watch it or did you sort of protect yourself? Um, for half of it, we were actually on holiday because um, my fiancé obviously knew that I would be pretty upset watching it and stuff so he actually um booked a holiday for sort of the front end 
of it but obviously as soon as I got back I was the first thing well, I where did where did you go to escape the Olympics um yeah exactly you can't really because well we went to um Portugal just for um a week which turned out to be a nightmare holiday anyway I got food poisoning so <laughs> but yeah as soon as I got back I was sort of straight on it watching anyway it was just to sort of get out of the build-up really because it was that that was sort of quite hard to watch because I really felt like I was missing out then and that was when it sort of sunk in and that was probably the hardest part that you know watching Rio was actually harder than recovering from the injury stuff as well because I think it then sunk in exactly what I had lost you know the opportunity to represent your country at an Olympic Games only comes around once every four years it's for an athlete that you know it's quite quite a big deal so that was yeah it wasn't enjoyable but at the same time I remember watching all the all the racing Paralympics and the Olympics and just you know it was incredible to watch but at the same time you know I was cheering and going mad I mean Jason Kenny's Kieran was just unbelievable I couldn't even sit down I sort of was getting closer and closer to the TV it was incredible but um yeah sort of afterwards I was a bit low then because it was like like you say I'd, I'd missed out really um, so where are you now? I mean, you mentioned earlier that you're hoping to be back. You, you've been back on the stationary bike, I think, for for a while, haven't you? Doing minimal amount, but what, what's where are you at now, and, and what's the ne- what do the next few weeks look like? So um, I'm just waiting on some MRI scan results, um, which I'm getting next Wednesday. Uh, just with regards to uh, where sort of muscles have attached and and the muscle really looking now at the muscle damage. I had a CT scan a couple of weeks ago and that was to sort of confirm bone position and everyone's happy with bones but now it's sort of getting really into the muscles and particularly the oblique like I mentioned which actually died off as you know and it's sort of been cut out so it's just to see where muscles have reattached how much stability I've got around my SIJ joint and things like that and it's just being passed around people really obviously I've got my surgeon's opinion Mr Cyan who's actually been inside my back and operated on me Um, the doctors and team at British Cycling have also got an opinion from Jerry Towns over in Leeds who's also run the scans by all the surgeons and practitioners and radiologists and stuff in the northwest they have sort of a, a monthly meeting so they're just trying to round up as much information as possible really to make sure that everyone knows exactly what's going on, exactly what muscles are in great condition, which ones aren't, so which ones to work on, exercises to avoid, movements to avoid, how quickly can I be loaded, is there anything I can and can't do, basically. So we're just trying to really paint that broad picture before I sort of delve in and start to ride, basically. But you're desperate to get back on on the track, aren't you? How, how, How do you think you'll feel first time back on the track I'm nervous I think definitely um it's just obviously I can't remember the crash so that's like I said a blessing in disguise but it gives me butterflies trying to think about doing it at the minute because I just feel like it is quite quite a way off but I'm sure once I'm back on I'll be back in the routine pretty quickly because I think it's sort of well it is obviously riding a bike but I think it's something that you don't forget I might be quite daunted again at the steepness of the velodrome. Definitely I'll sort of be flying around really quickly to make sure I don't slip to begin with. But um, it'll soon come back, I'm sure, after a few sessions. The nerves and the thought of sort of sliding down and crashing again, I'm sure it'll disappear quickly. And the the, the goal that you seem to have set your sights on uh, in the in medium term, I guess, is the come-off games next year. Yeah, definitely. I mean... Obviously, I thought I was going to sort of start training in January, so I am a bit behind where I would have liked to have been, which isn't isn't ideal. But, I mean, it just depends really on how quickly I can get fit. I'll either sort of start training and I'll respond quickly or I'll, it might, I might take longer to respond. But I'd like to think that I can be fit by Commie Games, but at the same time, I'm not going to be too disappointed if I can't make it because at the end of the day, the long-term goal is Tokyo like I mentioned earlier if it's the sake for the sake of just getting fit to make the commie games team and then breaking myself and then having Tokyo disappear from the picture it's not worth it at the end of the day the aim is the Olympics although Commonwealth Games is the big marker in between you know the Olympic cycles that's what's on the radar really so I mean you're doing this 
in a full awareness that it might not work because you were just telling me that you know your scans show a body that shouldn't even be able to do the things that you're already doing i.e riding a bit on a bike and, and walking around uh, yeah definitely i mean uh, richard freeman the doctor has been sort of open like that from day one you know he said it, there's no guarantee that you will be able to get back to the elite level it's not like i'm being asked to just ride a bike down the road you know on a on a push bike or whatever it's it's elite sport it's representing your country and being at the top of your game so there is no guarantee that i will get back to where i was but for sure i want to give it a good go because i believe that i can do it and i believe that i know my body and the team are willing to support me to try and get back to where i was but um yeah, I'm just up for giving it a go, really. I'm not one to give up, so to, you know, have these injuries and sort of feel sorry for myself and be like, I'm going to have to retire now. It's not something that I want to do. I've not achieved what I want to achieve. You know, I have got 15 international medals, but they're not the medals that I want. You know, I would like a world, a world gold medal and an Olympic medal. So until I've sort of reached, you know, the likes of Becky James, Shanae's Reid... Victoria Pendleton that is the aim so until I've sort of reached that I don't really feel like I've achieved what I would like to achieve no credit to the you know discredit to what I have achieved but I'm just it's not where I want to be yet so because are, I mean are there people I mean maybe family friends who, who do tell you that you're you're crazy to be trying to to become a, an international athlete again after what you've been through um definitely I mean I had mixed opinions from um my parents and stuff you know they sort of know the ins and outs and they've said to me you know please just be careful but I know I'm in the the best hands here at British Cycling and they are going to take things slow and steady and and not rush me really because like I said I'm not in a rush to get ready for a competition I just need to take it slow and and see how I get on and see how I respond to training but the bottom line is until I start no one's going to know how I'm going to respond so so that was a quite inspiring Vicky Williamson, and we wish her the best of luck as she continues her journey back to full health and fitness. Hopefully she'll be back racing again at some point soon and maybe uh, competing in the World Championships next year. Orla, we're now in a car speeding towards the English Channel and and home, Uh, but it's been a good day at Flesh Wallone. We have, since we last spoke to you, found out that Corinne Rivera is still in the leader's jersey uh, of the Women's World Tour. She leads those standings. But she's sticking to her plan, as she told us earlier, to not ride Leige Bastogne. Yeah, it's quite, quite, quite odd. Um, I, wonder if that, I wonder if there'll be a rethink even in the next couple of days. Yeah, it does sound very odd. And maybe that was an early call on her part, hoping that she'd be able to stick to her plan. When uh, Elisa Longo-Borghini rode into the uh, World Tour leader's jersey, she quite quickly had to change her plans to display it at the World Tour races, the following World Tour race. Um, so, yeah, it would be unusual if she didn't, really. An ASO organised event, obviously, Liege, Baston Liege. If, if they care about their Women's World Tour events, then they might not be very happy that the, the leader isn't riding. Uh, but I'm not sure how much they do care about their women's events. I mean, you know, Flesh Wallone has been running as a men's and women's event for a number of years now. I think it was 1998 it was uh, resurrected, the women's. Flesh I think this is the ninth year of, of the women's flesh alone and I was surprised it was a it was a brilliant race actually in terms of the crowds that were there uh, the action that we got to follow but you know I don't want to be t- too negative but there is a, a place to say um, that I, I find it disappointing that we couldn't follow the race live even as we were there so the start of the race was shown live on a big screen and then about 20 minutes after the race had started uh, the coverage stopped so for anyone who turned out this morning to watch the start of the race they had no way of following it from the finish line so they all had to, well, I mean they, they hung around but you weren't able to watch it and I find that really disappointing and it also begs the question what the point is really in um, a, a breakaway in women's racing because the point of it obviously in men's racing is that you get TV coverage you get um, attention drawn to your sponsor even if you've got no chance of winning the race in a women's race it really does seem to be suicidal because you get absolutely zero attention other than a little bit of a mention on Twitter so there's still a long way to go a long way to go with women's racing but the race itself was was fantastic to watch and we watched the boys race afterwards and it was very formulaic and dare I say it 
well, quite predictable and and yeah, you know, maybe even a little bit boring as it has been in recent years because it it, it just all comes down to the final two hundred meters really. The women's race, by all accounts, uh, from what we know, uh, was was pretty exciting, albeit. Uh, quite a familiar winner as well or I hate to correct you but actually it was 98 that Flesh Alone for women was first held so 19 editions as of the the start of this one's a 20 now my apologies but I would pull you up on that because I don't think you would hate to correct me in the slightest (laughs) (laughs) got me what a comeback anyway um, as I say we're in the car we're we're heading home Uh, next month's podcast Femina will be a little bit different again we're doing an event with Lizzie Dignan in Leeds, at Watterson's in Leeds. And uh, on Tuesday the 25th of April. That'll be just as this podcast is coming out. Um, but hopefully there'll be a good crowd there and we'll, we'll be recording it and putting it out next month as our uh, special uh, podcast femina for May. May. Oh, yeah. May. Ooh, yep. I don't know. Anyway, that's all for this month. Thank you very much, Orla. Thank you very much, Richard. You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. A little addendum to this month's cycling podcast Femina because the first women's Liège Bastogne Liège was held as we mentioned there four days after we returned from Flesh Wallone. Though like Flesh Wallone it was very difficult indeed to follow if you weren't there with no TV coverage disappointingly. Corinne Rivera teased us all by tweeting pictures of her wrecking the course a couple of days ago but then stuck to her word and gave it a miss. Uh, the race itself mirrored the two previous women's world tour races Amstel Gold Race and Flesh Wallone, Anna van der Breggen won alone again, and yet again her teammate Lizzie Dynan was second, and again for the third race in a row, Cassia Nevedoma of Marion Voss's WM3 Pro cycling team was third. Annemiek van Vluten took over the lead in the Women's World Tour. The Women's World Tour takes a short break now before the Tour of Chongming Island from the 5th to the 7th of May, and then a Tour of California from the 11th to the 14th of May. Finally, thanks very much indeed once again to our sponsors, Rafa and Science and & Sport, and a big thanks to Tom Wally for producing this month's episode.